My next guest is also no stranger to making history at NASA. General Charles Bolden was the first black administrator at the agency, and he's also a former astronaut. I want to say that. He's a former astronaut. It's very cool. <laughs> and Marine Corps Major General. Uh, General Bolden, Charlie, I've got permission to call you Charlie. I, I, it's, you know, I still, I, I'm one of these people that is still super awed by astronauts, super awed by space. You know, I get, I get goosebumps yeah. thinking about it. I'm, I'm, I'm not jaded yet on all of this. But I, I just want to say, you, you've been in space, I know, on four different times. You've been up there for 28 days. I just, you know, and, and it's becoming a, a more regular thing for other people out there that have had this experience, not for me. Share with us what that's like. What's that frontier like? Steve, I'm going to, I will do that, but you're going to have successive guests that are going to talk about the same thing. Mike Serfredini is one that we were just talking about a little while ago, who, um, it, who is actually taking a vision that we had when I was the NASA administrator of transitioning from government owned and operated uh, facilities in low earth orbit to putting it into the private sector. And you're going to talk to Ellen, Dr. Ellen Ochoa who was an astronaut with me and, and also the director of the Johnson Space Center at a time that we were transitioning from the space shuttle to, uh, to commercial capabilities of getting things into space. But going back to your question, it's awesome. It's a horrible <laughs> word to use. Um, although my mother was a, was a librarian, she was my, my middle school librarian, uh, she would be embarrassed that I can't come up with a better word than awesome because everybody uses it. But two things I use to describe space are two senses. One is feel. The other is sight, and um, I think sight is the is the sense that's most ex, that's most um, activated uh, once you have an opportunity to get to space. To get, you don't have to get very high. You you heard uh, William Shatner talk about his flight last week. You know, once you get to the point where you can see the curvature of Earth and you can see how thin our atmosphere is, and look at the dramatic difference between the blackness of space and the beautiful light of our planet in, in our daytime, um, it's unlike anything that, the, that you have ever seen on any picture or anything. God's cameras, our two eyes, afford us the opportunity to see this planet in a way that, that really changes your perspective on it all. I, I've talked to a lot of people who've been to space with very, very few exceptions, uh, does anyone disagree that it just changes your perspective on the planet? The part about feel, that's just, um, it, it's, it's kind of a giddy thing. Um, you float, and that's the easy way to explain it. It's technically, you're not floating. Technically, you're constantly falling back to Earth as gravity's trying to pull you down, and this force that we call centrifugal force created by the speed of going around the Earth is competing against gravity, and we're caught in the middle. So we have this feeling that we're floating. The closest thing I can offer to you is go to your local swimming pool, get in the deep end, and try to sink to the bottom. And unless you're really unusual, <laughs> you'll get part of the way down, and then all of a sudden, you're neutrally buoyant. And that's that's close to what it's like in space, except that you don't feel any effect of gravity in space because it's it's completely overwhelmed or overcome by centrifugal force. And balance doesn't work. Your you know your inner ear doesn't function because it has no no gravity reference for up and down. And that that's what takes people a little while to get adjusted to being in space. I think I'm going to be self-conscious uh, conscious about ever using the word float again. So I really appreciate the definition. But let me, let me ask you another question. You know, we're talking about the United States of America, which has you know, imp incredibly uh, uh, complicated domestic challenges right now. We also have international challenges out there. And I'm interested in where space fits in national yeah, yeah. aspiration, how space in national aspiration can become something that actually draws folks together, if you believe that. And I'm just interested in how, as we put the building blocks together for the future of this great country, where how we can make this journey more inclusive, how we can bring people together. You know, I, I'm just sort of interested in your insights into this, because I know you've, you've, you've worked this terrain yeah. a lot. See, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to um, not take a lot of time, but I, I love talking about space, but I love more talking about um, the more perfect union in which we are constantly searching, most of us, I, I will say. Um, it means a lot to me as an American, and it means a lot to people with whom I've worked, particularly in the military, the words that come from the preamble to the Constitution. And I was telling you earlier how much I am so proud that, that you all selected this as your topic, because space is the perfect unifier. It's the perfect uh, inspirational tool. It's something that uh, up until our time, and you mentioned it earlier, up until our time, it was something that people 
dreamed of. Uh, nobody ever seriously believed that they could really go do that. Some few, uh, and I was not one of them early on in life, some few really had this belief that they could go be astronauts. I was not one of them. I grew up in the segregated South. Um, I knew what astronauts were. I watched with great interest when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon the first time. Um, I was inspired and motivated and everything, but not one ounce of me said, I can go do that because that's just not what I grew up with. I didn't know any astronauts or see any astronauts who looked like me. Today is dramatically different. The space shuttle actually started it because the space shuttle gave us the opportunity to put seven, one time eight people on board a spacecraft, send them into space together, some qualified pilots and test pilots, some just scientists and engineers, and some, believe it or not, just common people. Uh, if they, All of us were common people, but I think you know what I mean. People who were not trained for that as a, as a living, as I was. And, and people of all races, creeds, colors, um, that was the beginning of, of connecting this um, uh, if you will, this inspirational, awe-inspiring thing that we call space to people back here on the ground. Because we could see somebody like a, like a Guy Bluford, who was the first African-American to go into space. Ron McNair, who inspired me to even apply for the program, who had grown up in Lake City, South Carolina, about 42 miles from me, dreamed since he was a child to be an astronaut and was going to do that no matter what. Ron, Franklin Chang Diaz, with whom I flew twice, who was born and raised in San Jose, Costa Rica, but decided at the age of seven he was going to be an astronaut and defied all the odds. So space allows people to dream and to believe in themselves and to do things. And I, you know, in, the Inspiration 4 flight is several weeks ago. That was probably the highlight uh, when we took four uh, n not technically formally trained people and sent them to space for three days and allowed them to, to do things that would benefit us back here on Earth. So sort of a long answer to your short question. But it, I think space is the ultimate unifier. Uh, it allows us to bring nations together. One of the things that President Obama asked me to do when I became the NASA administrator was expand the, the number of non-traditional partners that NASA had. Mm -hmm. If you look today, NASA has more than 800 active international agreements from everything to basic STEM education all the way up to human spaceflight. And they're with more than 120 countries. And many of those countries are countries that only dreamed of getting into the family of spacefaring nations. But today, because of space and because we can send normal people to space. Uh, they're a part of that of that family of spacefaring nations. And we work with countries like the Russians, and we work with mm -hmm. countries like the Japanese. Uh, arch enemies back in World War II, and uh, not the Russians, but the Japanese and the Germans, uh, but but the, the Cold War enemy of Russia. And today we're partners. Uh, I believe we can work collaboratively with China on orbit if, if we just put our hearts and souls to it. Um, so I, that's where I think space comes in. Well, look, I, I am, I am uh, uh, blown away by that vision. And I know that many of those deals of opening up the aperture of what NASA could do. I mean, we used to all just think the government did this. But now you've got no. deals with other countries. I participated, you know, as a moderator in the UAE's HOPE uh, uh, probe uh, that went to Mars. Uh, your former colleague, very good friend of mine, Ellen Stofan, the former chief scientist at NASA, got me all giddy about Mars and, you know, various dimensions and sort of looking at it. But I just want to ask you, you know, as we see now from when you did all these deals, we see the results now where popping every week. We've got, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to be talking to someone else in the program about the first commercial international space station. You see what uh, Elon Musk is doing, Richard Branson, other folks that they're, and, and it's not just joy flights, that there's serious uh, infrastructure that's going into space. And I guess my question to you is, after you laid out all of the, uh, the, the playbook for what could be done in going broader, um, and this will be our last big question, but, but how can we screw it up? Can we screw it up? Oh, oh, we can screw it up in a heartbeat. Uh, you know, I look at what's going on and I will drift off into a little bit of politics here. I looked at what's going on in our Congress today. Uh, for most Americans, there is no question about what the Congress and the administration should be doing. Can we screw that up? You bet we can. Uh, you know, there are real simple things that the Congress should be doing today, right now, about infrastructure and taking care of people. And yet we continue to play the game back and forth. That's, um, you know, for people in Congress, that's great. For people like you and me sitting down here or people on the street, um, we don't get it. We don't appreciate it, to be quite honest. And um, so, yes, we can screw it up. If the United States 
decides that we no longer want to be the leaders in space exploration and science and technology, all we need to do is back up and not fund it the way that we frequently have done in the past. We're on a good trajectory right now. I, one of the things that made me happy about the term of the former president's administration uh, was the fact that they did not mess with NASA. Uh, they had ideas of things they wanted to do. They 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 touched around the edges. You know, they said, "Okay, we're going to put the first woman and and other people on the moon by 2024." Well, that was a gimmick, and every I think everybody knew that. But the point was, they continued the the, the path, the trajectory on which President Obama and President Bush before him and President Bush before him and President Clinton, they had all put us on this positive trajectory to send humans beyond low Earth orbit. And we're well on the way to doing that. But it just takes persistent effort, persistent support, and a term that we developed in talking to Congress, constancy of purpose. The U.S. has to decide that our purpose is to lead the nation in everything, in technology, in science, in medicine, uh, you know, in, in human rights, and, uh, and then decide that we're going to do that. But you can't come in and go out and come in and go out because you'll find, as happened over the past administration, people will walk away from you and they'll go find others that they think are more serious. That's why many people are looking at China today, uh, because they at mm. least believe that China is on a persistent march and will continue to fund. Um, you and I know, you know, I'm not sure we buy that, but, uh, but that's what people follow. They follow where there looks like there's hope and people are going to fund it and, and are going to support it long term. America has to develop a constancy of purpose in wanting to be the leaders of the world in every, every field there is. Charlie, I'm going to squeeze in one last one. Um, I know diversity and inclusion is important to you. It's important to us. Uh, I'm just interested in whether the space program, as you see it moving forward, gives us an inflection point to change the pattern, to make diversity and inclusion real in this sector as opposed to faking it. I am passionate about diversity and inclusion. I think you know that. But I'm also one who tells young women and people of color, don't talk about it. You know, don't waste your time trying to convince somebody that you belong. Do your job. Do it well. All I can do is point to, to astronauts like Christina Koch, uh, point to astronauts like Victor Glover, uh, women, people of color who have flown and excelled and, uh, and have become leaders in their own right. And we need to notice that there's something different about that person. Oh, that's a woman. Hmm. Oh, he's black. Hmm. Uh, I just, you know, I looked at him as an astronaut the first time around, but he is he is different. And it's important that people recognize our physical differences because that is diversity. Uh, you know, people want to argue about diversity and inclusion. Diversity is the fact that God made us different in a lot of different ways. Thought, speech, color of skin, uh, religious beliefs, hmm. you name it. But that's what space has allowed us to do is take people of diverse backgrounds and cultures and races and genders and allow them to perform and excel. And I just ask people to look and, and rather than talk about it, say, you know, I like what that group's doing. And I'm going to say it's because they have this diversity uh, that's making up this group. And I like that and I want some more of it. Well, I just want to thank General Charles Bolden. Charlie, uh, former astronaut, four times up there, Marine Corps Major General, uh, and for eight years uh, ran NASA as administrator there. I really appreciate your candor. I appreciate your, your enthusiasm for a more perfect <laughs> union. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and good luck with the series. It is awesome.